Jack here, JBF Music and Guitar Lessons, and back with one of these critiques for you. It's like an, essentially a, an informal analysis. The guitarist we have in question here is Chuck Schuldiner, Schuldiner. I'm never sure how to pronounce his second name. Do let me know in the comments. Of course, best known from the band Death. You can check out a comprehensive breakdown of three of his signature guitar licks with the eye up there. Basically, the process I go through to find these licks is listen to lots of songs, lots of things he's written, look at performances and live things, look for the nuances and also the kind of commonalities in his playing, things that happen a lot. If you like this, please do let me know with a like, comment, and the old subscribe thing. If you dislike it, feel free to smash that dislike button as well. If you let me know what you don't like, I can take it on board. I can at least try and do something about it. With that being said, when interesting things pop up, I will pause the video, I'll talk about them. So if you just want to watch the original thing, or you want a reaction video where someone doesn't really say much, this probably isn't for you. If you want to maybe learn something and get a bit of an idea about what's going on, then stick around. The clip I've got up here, that took me so long to say, I must have done about three takes. I <laughs> just stumbled it over my own words there. Sorry. <laughs> So for my own for my own amusing it's um crystal mountain which is probably my, my favorite death song by, by a fair stretch i might have seen this video a long time ago but then again i might not if my memory is not what it used to be and clearly my pronunciation of words isn't either well, let's crack into it <laughs> The first thing that strikes me is just kind of how almost contemporary the sound is. Like if you listen to like a, a, a like a line recording of a live metal gig, so it's like a, or like a kind of a rock and roll band, like Avenged Sevenfold. The sound is going to be pretty similar to this. The, the the kick drum's got that kind of click on it, so it's really defined. It's actually kind of like a bit of a high end reverb on it here, which is quite interesting. The bass is really taking care of that low end. It's giving it that kind of womb for that full sound. Guitars, Marshall's probably an SM57 on it that's just kind of nice, clear, crisp, heavy sound. And then that kind of dissonant harmonised bit as well, which I suspect was maybe in fourths or something like that. You can get a quite a cool dissonant harmony if you if you play something in fourths or fifths. It can still be in key, but it sounds a bit alien and out there. So. I have to say as well, like his, his vocals, there's like no processing on them there. It's like I, I can't hear like any reverb or anything to make them sound bigger. And for a live performance, it's just that's just a great performance. And as far as I know, he was one of like the guy, or at least one of them that really kind of pioneered this kind of style of like growling rather than singing, I suppose. But still quite melodic. It's not too uh, too distorted with the, the kind of vocal fry going on. There's still uh, almost like a pitch to it. So there, like when he was doing the chorus, you can almost hear a pitch in it. It's a bit like, um, it'd be like in Flames, like Clayman or something like that. I must have taken a huge influence from it. The other thing I really like about this tune here is the, the, the guitar tone. I don't know if he's changing uh, drive channels, but there's just a lovely amount of overdrive when he's letting those little uh, open notes ring into each other, when they're still distorted and it's still kind of heavy, but it's clear enough that the notes are really well defined. You can really hear them. That has to be like one of the most metal guitars ever, doesn't it? It's like a... I can't even remember what you call that shape, that kind of X shape. There's just a bridge pickup and a volume pot. There's, there's no tone on it. All the pointy bits. He's got all the pointy bits of the guitar. So I wanted to kind of pause it here when we're during the tom fill. So before I was talking about how there was quite a lot of high end on the, the kick drum and it was really nice and defined, almost in that kind of clicky modern way you get now. And the toms, there's like no boom to them. There's just a really clear kind of almost like a pitched, almost like a, a pitched percussion. With the way they've been EQ, there's not any of that kind of <laughs> underneath them, which again is kind of a modern thing you get in metal, just a really tight tom without any of that kind of ringing out, which you'd get more in kind of classic or kind of Zeppelin style rock, that big kind of bottom. You know, John Bonham kind of sound. I, 
another classic metal trope. You're kind of changing the tempo. It's going to kind of like a half time feel, big boom, ringing out chord, and a kind of Phrygian dominant sound. If you want to know more about that scale, you can check it out with the eye up there. I like how little effort they've put into their uh, stage outfits as well. It looks like these are just the clothes they wear and they've just gone on wearing them. There's something, there's something kind of cool about the, the 90s thrash scene. I know it doesn't really count as thrash, but in, in the same ballpark in terms of the, the dress code that they're just like rock about in the same gear. Okay, that's like a real quintessential lick, isn't it? I'm probably going to have to put that in the signature licks. I really like as well, uh, the guitars are harmonising here. I suspect it's maybe like uh, in a fifth or something like that. It doesn't feel too empty, even though there's no rhythm guitar. The bass is just full and fat enough. And the bass is also playing some really quite interesting notes where it's making the, the melody feel a bit more dissonant and evil, but not too out there that it doesn't sound, uh, you know, musically coherent. A uh, great bit of writing. It's just an unrelenting lead that he does, isn't it? It's just this like, it's almost like Mustaine where it's kind of like almost like a pickaxe into your head, but in the, in the nicest way possible. And I'd also say there, everything in the band here is sitting really nicely in the mix. You can hear everything clearly, yet it's still kind of cohesive as one overall, you know, one overall kind of sonic sound. I think that is one of my favourite rock drum beats as well, that dum -ka -dum -ka. It just gives this like amazing kind of drive and almost kind of groovy but still heavy. I think it's in um, something very similar to in Lights Out as well, the, the UFO song. <laughs> That is such a great hook, that little kind of little kind of haunting guitar part and then the vocals acting on the call and response. It's a fantastic bit of writing. thing I'll say about his writing as well, there's a for, for me there's a really nice mix between doing the kind of slightly more dissonant atonal stuff like the, some of his solo and then you've got those nice melodic lines like in the chorus and then that kind of theme there that he's played a few times so instead of just playing it once and never coming back to it, he's played that you know a fair bit so we recognise it and that's like a nice kind of minor pattern, it's not too out there in terms of the note choice, it's quite quite consistent, quite totally minor, something we can kind of recognise. It's just got this great mixture of putting the more dissonant, edgy stuff with things that are a bit more like palatable. So for someone like me that's got a fairly low threshold of metal in terms of how heavy it gets, it, this is just a great mix. Great mix of styles. <laughs> God bless the roadie, you probably see a, a little hand sneak in there and adjust the mic that's on the top. These people don't run about the stage sorting the mics out that musicians have knocked over by mistake, the whole thing would fall apart. 
Rory's in gaffer tape. That's the secret to it. That's what you need. It's really consistent as well. I really haven't heard, you know, anything going wrong. I think that the drummer maybe slurred one fill quite a while back, but just like one note and then they're back on it like that. Really nice tight band here. A ferocious way to end it, like a Malmstonian, Malmstonian style, however you want to call it, run, and then just a brutal pinch harmonic. Fantastic. Cool. So that has definitely helped me narrow down on some of the areas of his playing I want to explore. Having said that, I definitely won't be able to fit everything that he does into three, three humble signature licks. So let's look at some of the ideas and concepts that popped up in that video. Okay, I haven't tried this approach before, so let me know what you think about it, but because I just looked at a song rather than a collection of solos or something like that, I'm just going to break down some of the riffs that we have here. So you had this, uh, the main one. So we've got a kind of gallop on the E. Hitting an E up here. Then we're hitting uh, an E flat or a D sharp power chord there right so in terms of the theory we're sort of in a, an e flat or d sharp for g and that kind of thing and then you have that same as the first bar and it just goes kind of, uh, not too dissonant here we've got a b then to b flat probably call it an a sharp really and if you think about it here all we're really doing is putting in one accidental note this note here so you can get away with it there's nothing too crazily atonal but then we go from an F to a G. So here, to my ears, what we've kind of done is switch the tonality to E for G. And so I'm hearing it, and you know, this is somewhat subjective, so if you've got another analysis, go for it. But I'm hearing it as going from like an E flat for G and up to E for G and back to the E. So the E would be the E flat, let's call it D sharp, that makes more sense. And the D sharp for G, and then when we go here, still in the D sharp, then to the E here. Because I kind of want to go to that chord, right? Which is just typical for G and stuff. You know, like Metallica, Megadeth. All those great chunky riffs. Should mention before we go any further, I'm in standard tuning. I think the original is down in D standard, so hopefully that'll avoid any confusion. The next cool bit is the chorus, and after analyzing this, I realized it's actually based around uh, an A A9, which is a really nice chord. So we got this thing. doing is playing that open A, the E string, that's A's fifth, right, so that's kind of still kind of normal chord, and then the B, you're getting this A9, then this fifth fret here is A's flat third, so this is where you get that tension, you're getting the dissonance from this note here, the second to the flat third, so it's like semitone. By themselves it is very tense, but when you put the rest of the chord in context, tension is diminished a little bit. It's still a, a tense interval to play, but it feels a bit more floaty. After that, we're going to, uh, although this is a kind of interesting uh, 
Chord voicing, you could think of that way as an extended chord. To my ears, we're essentially going a G to an F. So I, I'm hearing this as an A minor or A minor 9 for two bars, right? Then to a G and an F, essentially. But the G is decorated. So you've got the G, the A, and the E. So you've got the second and the sixth. So you could argue that this is an A minor 7. Like you've got the A, you've got the E, but with a seventh on the bottom, the G. You could argue that. But I do not hear it as being an A minor 7. In terms of the progression, that would be something like... And I'm hearing it very much as a G with some sort of extensions on the top of it. So I suppose you could call that a G, add 2, add 13 if you want to get technical about it. The F is much more straightforward. You've got the F and then the C. So a root then a 5th, essentially a power chord. And then using this 5th uh, fret here, the 6th, as a really nice joining note. Because it kind of wants to go back to that A. The next riff I've got is maybe more of a lick, it's one of those lead bits I was talking about that I quite liked. So again, this is all based in A minor, we'll play it and then we'll break it down. So as you can probably hear here, it's largely A minor going up. You know, if you think of your A Aeoli. What's pretty cool is in the next bar, instead of doing the same sequence, things are changed up a bit. So we kind of go... And then when we go to this 12th fret, right, where it sounds dissonant, that's a B. So again, this is kind of hinting at that nice um, A9 we had, because B is A's ninth, right? Coming back down... It's almost a kind of a Hirojoshi type thing. If I've got any cards left, I'll link to that up there. It's a, a kind of exotic Japanese scale. And to wrap it up. What's really cool about ending on that note, another B, so again, hitting at that kind of A9 thing, is it really wants to go to the A after this. Like if we play that lick in context. position in me wants it to go there and it does with the next riff it's just a great bit of part writing connecting the sections together <laughs> yeah a bit slower if you want to have a go Okay, so let's break that down for good measure as well. And as you may have suspected at this point, there's a theme going on. There's another bit of a lovely A9 chord going on. So you basically got here, right? It's your third of A, and it's your C. Then we're going down to E, which is the fifth. We're pedaling open to A, which is the root. Back up to the fifth. And then whenever we hit this ninth fret here, that's a B. So that is the ninth. So you've essentially got this move where you're going from uh, A minor down to an A minor nine. Again, it's a very kind of a contemporary metal sound. So anytime it's here, it's outlining an A minor. Anytime here, it's ending at the ninth. Final thing to discuss here is I made a, a somewhat half-hearted attempt to get the tone, but in a way that was still playable to me. I think it was the proper kind of death metal ice pick thing I'd, I'd really struggle to play coherently at all. It's just not a sound I'm comfortable using. But what I did with the signal chain here is I took a metal zone essentially and put it into a, a Marshall. The metal zone's getting most of the tone from that. And the other one I went for something a bit more kind of, for, for me, a bit nicer. So I took a tube screamer and put it into like a 5150 thing. So you've got the kind of higher ice pickness coming from the metal zone and the kind of fatness coming from the, the 5150 essentially. I've dialed in just enough gain so that you can still kind of dig in and get a chunky card, but if you pick lighter, you get that kind of nice 
charity that I was talking about before. Check out that video if you want to learn the signature licks. Hit subscribe and do the enable all notifications thing if you don't want to miss out on new content. But take it easy, guys. Have a good one.